Welcome to the Deep Dive. We're here to give you that shortcut uh, straight to being the most informed person around. We cut through the noise, get right to the essentials. And today, well, we're taking a really close look, a high def tour, if you will, inside the world of GI technology. We're drawing heavily from Dr. Raju's excellent YouTube videos uh, and related research on modern endoscopy. Now, this is especially for you if you work in the GI lab, nurses, techs. But honestly, it's pretty fascinating stuff for anyone curious about how we, you know, explore inside the body without big operations. We're mapping the gut and the tools we use. Exactly. We're looking at these incredibly engineered tools that docs use every day. And not just to look, but often to treat things right then and there in the digestive tract. The big idea we keep coming back to is this one tool, two jobs concept. Efficiency. Find the problem, maybe fix it, all in one go. Right. And, and the basics are these flexible scopes, aren't they? Go in through natural openings, send back live video. But the key for the pros, the working channels, right? Those tiny tunnels inside the scope. Absolutely crucial. They're not just for air or water. They're the pathways for instruments. You know, forceps for biopsies, snares for polyps, tools to stop bleeding like clips or heat probes, even injecting meds. And most patients are comfortably sedated for this. Light sedation, breathing on their own. That's the standard, light sedation. It keeps patients comfortable. They breathe fine on their own. It really is peak, minimally invasive stuff. Okay, so thinking about these scopes, Dr. Raju uses a great analogy in the source material. Think of them like a team of explorers. Each one is built for a different part of the digestive terrain. And their names basically tell you the route, which is handy. You hear gastro, entero, colono, duodeno. You instantly know where it's designed to go. Whole team. Yeah. Okay, let's break down the main five explorers then, starting, I guess, at the top, where things usually begin. Makes sense. Let's start with the gastroscope. Uh, clinically, we call the procedure an EGD. That stands for esophago-gastroduodenoscopy. Quite a mouthful. EGD. Got it. And that covers the esophagus, stomach, and retinitis. Where does it typically end up? So, yeah, mouth first, obviously. Down the esophagus gives the stomach a good look over, mapping all those folds. And then it pushes into the first bit of the small intestine, the duodenum. Usually it gets down to what's called the duodeno jejunal flexure, the DJ flexure. That's kind of a sharp bend where the small bowel really starts. Okay, so that's the go-to for upper gut issues. Things like trouble swallowing, bad reflux, ulcers, checking for bleeding, or maybe early tumors. Exactly. It's the workhorse for the upper GI tract. And technically, what makes it so good at its job? beyond just the camera. Well, it's incredibly versatile, taking biopsies as standard, sealing bleeders too. But some newer EGD scopes, and this is neat, they have two working channels. Two channels, how does that help? Think about it. If you need to grab something, say a small polyp, and also snare it, you can have both tools down at the same time. A grasper in one channel, a snare in the other. For the team in the room, especially during a tricky bleed or a complex polyp removal, that saves time. You're not pulling one tool out to put another one in. It really boosts efficiency when things get complicated. That makes sense. Okay, so moving down the system, the colonoscope. This one's huge for prevention, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. This is our lowland adventurer. Its journey starts at the other end, the anal canal, through the rectum. And the aim is to see the entire large intestine, the colon, right up to the cecum. Often, we even get a little peek into the very last part of the small intestine, the terminal ileum, and its main mission, finding and removing polyps, getting them before they even have a chance to turn into cancer. That's the core prevention piece. Plus, of course, checking for bleeding or inflammation, like colitis. It looks different from the EGD scope, longer, obviously. What's special about its design for navigating that winding colon? Yeah, it's a tougher journey. So first, it's much longer. But the key feature, especially for the person driving the scope and the tech assisting, is adjustable stiffness. Some parts of the colon have really sharp turns, like the sigmoid. Being able to make the scope insertion tube stiffer or more flexible helps navigate those corners without causing loops or minimizing them. It gives better control, helps reach the end safely, and again, efficiently. It diagnoses, sure, but its power is really in that immediate treatment getting those polyps out. So EGD for the top, colonoscope for the bottom. Mm -hmm. What if the problem's hiding somewhere in the middle, in that long stretch of small intestine? Ah, that's when you call in the deep wilderness specialist, the enteroscope. Its job starts when EGD and colonoscopy haven't found the answer, especially for, say, hidden bleeding. It follows the EGD path, but just keeps going, way down into the small bowel, the jejunum, sometimes even further. That sounds long. <laughs> and technically challenging for the team handling the scope extremely it's a very long very slender scope 
Managing that length, trying to advance it deep without it just coiling up inside, that takes real skill from the whole team. Pushing, pulling, torquing, it's demanding, but it's necessary to find those problems the other scopes just can't reach. Hidden bleeding sources, maybe weird growths, or areas that have narrowed down called strictures. Okay, now for the odd one out, the duodenoscope, the ERCP scope, it looks sideways. Why the side view? What's that about? Right, this one's unique. It's a side viewing scope because its main target isn't actually the lining of the duodenum itself. It's aiming for something next to the duodenum, specifically the tiny opening where the bile duct, bringing bile from the liver and gallbladder, and the pancreatic duct from the pancreas empty into the intestine. This little doorway is called the ampulla or papilla. You need that side view to line up perfectly with that tiny opening to get access to those ducts. You couldn't do it looking straight ahead. And the procedure is ERCP. Endoscopic Retrograde Telangiopancreatography. Okay, so you line up, then what? How does it work? Once you're positioned, a very thin tube, a catheter, is threaded through the scope's channel and guided right into that impula opening. Then, contrast dye is injected. While that's happening, we use X-rays fluoroscopy to watch the dye fill the ducts. It creates a map showing us if there are blockages, like gallstones stuck in the bile duct or maybe narrowed areas. And then the two jobs part kicks in. We can often treat right away. Pass instruments through the scope to pull out stones, or maybe place a little tube, a stent, to keep a narrowed duct open and draining properly. It's complex, needs x-ray techs, specialized gear, real teamwork. Wow, okay. One more category. The EUS scopes, the subsurface investigators. Yeah. EUS means endoscopic ultrasound. Exactly. This is like adding another sense. There's a tiny ultrasound probe built right onto the tip of the scope. So instead of just seeing the surface inside the gut, we use sound waves to see through the wall. We can visualize things nearby. Lymph nodes, blood vessels, organs like the pancreas that sit right behind the stomach and duodenum. It's looking deeper. And there are two main types of EUS scopes with different jobs. Yes, two main designs and knowing which is which is key for the team. There's radial EUS and linear EUS. Okay, walk us through them. What's the difference? Is there an easy way to remember? Sure. Radial EUS gives you a full 360 degree cross-sectional image. Think of it like looking all around. It's fantastic for mapping out the layers of the gut wall, seeing how deep a tumor might go, or just getting the general lay of the land. Staging tumors is a big use. Then there's linear EUS. This one lines up the ultrasound beam with the instrument channel. Why? So you can guide a needle. If you see something suspicious deep inside, like a lump in the pancreas or an enlarged lymph node near the esophagus, the linear scope lets you watch on ultrasound as you guide a fine needle directly into it to get a tissue sample, a biopsy. So the memory trick we use is radial to look around, linear to look, and sample. Radial around, linear to sample, got it. Okay, that's the toolkit. But the real skill is knowing when to use which tool. Mm -hmm. How did that decision process work in practice? Can we run through some typical situations? Yeah, let's connect the tools to the symptoms. Picture this. Case one, someone's had bad heartburn for years. Now they're saying it hurts to swallow, something new. Okay, alarm bells for the upper tract, esophagus, maybe stomach. That sounds like a job for the EGD, right? Check the lining, biopsy, anything unusual. Look for inflammation, Barrett's changes, maybe early cancer. Precisely, direct visualization and biopsy capability. Classic EGD scenario, diagnosis and risk check in one go. All right, case two. Someone does a routine screening test, maybe a stool card, and it comes back positive for hidden blood. They don't see any bleeding, but the test picked it up. That screams colon. Got to check the whole thing. Colonoscopy is the obvious choice there. Inspect everywhere, and crucially, if you find polyps, you take them out right then. Yep, prevention mode fully engaged. That's the power of screening colonoscopy. Okay, case three. Bit trickier. A teenager comes in with black, tarry stools. That means digested blood, probably from high up, or maybe the small bowel. But here's the twist. A good EGD and a full colonoscopy were both totally normal. Ugh, the mystery bleed. The source is hiding deep. That's the cue for the deep wilderness specialist. Time for enteroscopy. We need to push way down into that small intestine, search the jejunum, maybe the ileum, find what the standard scopes couldn't reach. Makes sense. Now, case four. Patient turns yellow, jaundiced, and has terrible belly pain pancreatitis, and they have a history of gallstones. You suspect a stone has escaped the gallbladder and is blocking the main bile duct. Okay, now we're thinking about the plumbing, the ducts. This points straight to ERCP. It's complex. You need that side viewing duodenoscope, the x-ray setup, the special widers and baskets or balloons to pull out the stone, maybe place a stent. High stakes needs that coordinated team effort. And last one, case five. Maybe a CT scan shows something worrying near the esophagus or the pancreas. Enlarged lymph nodes, 
or a possible mass. But it's outside the gut wall itself. You need to know what it is. Right. The problem isn't on the surface, it's deeper. That's prime territory for EUS, specifically the linear EUS. You need those detailed ultrasound images of the area around the gut, and you need that guided needle capability to get a tissue sample. Fine needle aspiration or FNA, get the cells to pathology for a diagnosis, often avoiding major surgery just to find out what's going on. Okay, so looking at that decision flow, mm -hmm. if the standard EGD and colonoscopy don't find the cause of bleeding, enteroscopy is often that next step for the small bowel. Correct. And for those duct issues, the bile duct or pancreatic duct, it's often that EUS then ERCP sequence. EUS does the detailed look first, figures out exactly what's going on, where the stone is, how big the mass is. That EUS info then guides the whole plan for the ERCP that might follow. What tools do we need? How tricky will it be? EUS maps it, ERCP treats it. A real diagnostic therapeutic one-two punch. Let's quickly recap the main roles then. EGD, upper GI lining expert, colonoscopy. Lower GI lining, king of cancer prevention. Enteroscopy tackles the deep, small bowel mysteries. ERCP, the side viewing duct specialist for mapping and fixing blockages. And EUS, the subsurface investigator, using ultrasound for imaging and targeted biopsies. It really does drive home how efficient modern endoscopy has become. That ability to see the problem and often start fixing it, sometimes completely fix it, in the same procedure, that's huge for patients. Less hassle, faster answers, better outcomes. Absolutely. And pulling back, looking at the source material, what really strikes you is how perfectly the design of each tool matches its specific job. It's pure form follows function. Every modification making a scope longer, adding stiffness control, putting the camera on the side, adding ultrasound, it wasn't random. Each change was a direct engineering response to a biological or anatomical challenge inside the body. It's a fantastic story of engineering meeting biology to help people. That's a great way to think about it. Engineering solving biological puzzles. So as you go about your day, maybe think about that. How many medical fixes rely on this kind of clever, specialized design to get inside, see the problem, and fix it remotely? Turning something complex into a targeted solution. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive into the world of endoscopy.